conclude our three-part series called Under the Influence. Yeah, people will and won't do what they wouldn't normally when they are under the influence. We've been using uh, for a foundation the scripture uh, found in 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 25. I want to read it one more time this morning. And it says there that no one else so completely sold himself to what was evil in the Lord's sight as Ahab did. Notice the next thing it says, under the influence of his wife. Jezebel. Ahab already possessed a wicked heart, but when his heart became entangled with Jezebel's heart, Jezebel's influence over him caused Ahab's wickedness to literally soar off the charts. I want to remind you what I've said previously twice. I'm going to say it one more time, and that is everyone influences and everyone is influenced. Well, today I want to talk about the greatest Influencer. How many's had some good influencers in your life? Amen. You've been blessed with good influence and good influencers. Well, we've all had good influencers in our life, but I want to talk about the greatest influencer. And of course, the greatest influencer and the one that we should emulate is none other than Jesus Himself. Amen. Yeah, no one has had greater influence than Jesus. He's been gone physically from this earth for over 2,000 years, and yet his influence lives on. Let me ask you this this morning. What kind of influence will live on through the lives of the people that you have influenced once you are gone? Let me admonish you this morning. Don't take the good parts of your life with you to the grave. No, no. No, impart them to others so that your legacy can live on through others years and decades after you are gone. Amen. Well, if you read the story of Jesus in the Gospels, you're going to discover that the people were all about the crowd. Man, they were, they were all about the crowd, enamored with the crowd. But Jesus was all about the core. The people were all about the crowd. They were all about the miracles. They were all about the hoopla, all about his public ministry. But, but Jesus was all about mentoring 12 men. He was all about influencing 12 men, training them, teaching them, pouring into them. He focused more on his private ministry than he did his public ministry. Mark chapter 3 and verse number 14 says, speaking of Jesus, it says, and he appointed 12, watch this, watch this, he appointed 12 that they might be with him, that they might be with him. Him. See, Jesus knew the power of his influence, and so he made imparting his influence over 12 men his main priority. He knew that one, of the, one day he would be leaving the greatest message, the greatest hope, the only way to salvation. He would leave it in the hands of these 12 men. So he took every opportunity that he had to pass on to them who and what he was. I want us to take a few minutes today and look at how Jesus, the greatest influencer, how he influenced. And I'm going to suggest three ways this morning. First of all, I want to suggest to you that he influenced through his example. Yeah, he influenced through Example In John chapter 13 and verse 15, Jesus said, Jesus said, I have given you an example of what? Jesus said, I have given you an example so that you can do for others what I have done for you. Jesus influenced through example. I don't know, but perhaps there is no greater way to influence than through this Way. I, want to, I want to share four ways that Jesus influenced his disciples through example. And the first is they saw him pray. Yeah, he, he, he led by example. He influenced through example. They saw him pray. See, Jesus didn't just preach or teach about prayer. He prayed. Uh, he didn't just tell them that they needed to pray, but, but, but he set the example. In prayer, in Luke chapter 5 and verse 16, the word of the Lord says, Jesus withdrew to the, to the wilderness often to pray. Say often. 
And in Luke chapter 9 and verse 18, it says, And Jesus was alone, as Jesus was alone praying, his disciples joined in. See, see, Jesus knew how powerful that prayer was. And Jesus knew how desperately that his disciples were going to need this power. And especially after he was gone. And so Jesus used his influence to teach them the value of prayer. He did this through example. They saw him pray. But also they saw his passion leading by example. Influencing by example. They saw, they saw his passion. If, if you read the Gospels, you will discover that Jesus was very passionate. I don't know, maybe even a bulldog. Some of the things he said in the scripture we read this morning would take a bulldog to say. He wasn't afraid to show his emotions. He, he, he wasn't always politically correct. He was passionate, and when he was passionate about something, you knew it. In John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, it records such an incident. You know the story where Jesus goes uh, into the temple, and he sees those that are in the temple, and the Bible says that Jesus took a whip, and he ran out of the temple, those that were using the temple for personal gain. The Bible says that Jesus literally flipped the tables over of the money changers that were taking advantage of the people financially. Jesus said, my house is a house of prayer, but Jesus said, you have turned it into a house of prophets. Jesus wasn't afraid to let them see his passion. He, he was angry and he displayed his anger. See, anger in and of itself is not sin. In fact, the Bible says, be angry but don't sin, or don't sin when you are angry. It doesn't say don't be angry. It says when you are angry, do not sin. See, the anger of Jesus was a righteous anger. It was a holy anger. He got angry about the right things. He didn't get angry because some camel caught, you know, cut him off in traffic. <laughs> He, he, he got angry about the right things. And listen to me this morning. You and I, we need, we need some of this holy anger. We need to get angry. This, we, need, we need to get angry at sin, our sin. We need to get angry at the impure motives that are in ministry. We need to get angry at hypocritical methods. We need to get angry at laziness and lack of vision in the church. We need to get angry at replacing praying with playing, replacing power with political correctness, replacing principles with preference. Jesus was all about what was right, not what was in style. He was about what was holy, not what about made people happy. Read the Gospels, read the Gospels, and you will see his passion, oh, as it comes through over and over and over again. But not only did the disciples see Jesus pray, not only did they witness his passion, but they saw his pain. See, Jesus wasn't afraid to let his disciples see his humanity. He allowed them to see him cry. John eleven thirty five 35 says that Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And Luke chapter 22, verse 39 through 44 says that, that, that Jesus was in, in such pain and in such anguish and turmoil that his sweat literally turned into blood. Jesus influenced through example. He, he didn't put on his game face 24-7. He, he didn't fake it till he made it. He was real. He was genuine. He was authentic. He had feelings, and he wasn't afraid to show them. Here's what I know, and that is people appreciate it when we get real with them. I said people appreciate it 
when we get real with him and don't pretend to be Superman or Wonder Woman. See, see, they can't relate to superheroes, but when we are willing to reveal our struggles, when we allow them to see our pain and see our hurt and, and witness our unanswered questions, Jesus was the Son of God. Absolutely, he, he, he was the Son of God. He was 100% God, but he was also the Son of Man. I can't explain it, but 100% God, but also 100% man. And in his humanity, he had his struggles. It's hard to think about Jesus struggling, isn't it? But, but in his humanity, he struggled. He had pain. He had anguish. He had difficulty. In his humanity, he, he, he had struggles just like you, just like me. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that Jesus experienced every struggle and every temptation that is known to man. Oh, but the good thing about it is that he overcome, or overcame every single one. For example, Jesus showed his disciples how to walk through the painful experiences of life and come out on the other end victorious. I ask you this morning, how are we influencing those under our influence through the way we handle the painful times of life? Are we becoming bitter or better? Does our spirit remain sweet or does it turn Sour. Are we an asset or a liability as an example? We're talking about the greatest influencer. We're talking about Jesus. He influenced through example. His disciples saw him pray. They saw his passion. They saw his pain. And they saw him practice what he preached. John 13 and 15, Jesus said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done Unto you. See, Jesus didn't just preach servanthood. He didn't just preach about meeting needs, but, but when the moment came, he practiced what he preached. The Bible says that in this instant, he, he, he took a bowl of water and he took a towel and he literally knelt before the disciples' dirty, disgusting, stinking feet. They had been walking along in sandals or barefoot, and, and their, their, their feet, their feet were, were dirty. And when they came to eat together and to spend time together, and there was no servant there, but, but Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He washed off the dirt and the dung that was on the feet of his friends. The Savior became the servant. The one who deserved to be served humbled himself and began to serve. They saw him practice what he preached. The greatest influencer influenced through example. But I'd also suggest to you this morning that he also influenced through exhortation. See, Jesus took advantage of every possible situation and turned it into a teachable moment. He taught them publicly. Matthew chapter 11 and verse number one says that Jesus went from town to town preaching and teaching. And Mark chapter 1, verse 38 and 39, Jesus said, Jesus says, hey, to his disciples, he says, hey, we must go into other towns too so I can preach and teach there also. Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He, he went from town to town. He went from city to city, from village to village, from place to place, preaching and teaching everywhere he went. He never had a problem drawing a crowd, and he never wasted a crowd or an opportunity to speak publicly. He taught them publicly, but he taught them through parables. Taught them through par Now, a parable was an illustration or a story. Someone one time uh, chewed me out. 
and criticized me because I used stories in my sermon and illustrations in my sermon. And I said, excuse me, I'm just modeling after the greatest preacher ever. His name is Jesus. I mean, Jesus was a storyteller. Hello? He, he taught them through parables. A parable was an illustration. It was a story. And Jesus could hold his audience spellbound for literally hours at a time through his unique stories and illustrations. Even children loved his stories. Remember one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 families? He fed them all you can eat fish and chips, remember? Where did he get the five loaves and the two fish? He got them from a little boy. The Bible calls him a lad. I submit to you that a greater miracle than feeding 5,000 families with only five loaves of bread and two fish a greater miracle in, uh, about this is in where the loaves and the fish came from. They came from a Flintstones lunchbox <laughs> that the little boy didn't open all day long. Yeah. Now that's quite a storyteller when you can hold the attention of a little boy for hours without milk and cookies. My little five-year-old grandson, we took him and Ellie yesterday to the trampoline place, and he's jumping on the trampoline for just about three minutes, and then he says to me, next. <laughs> Can you imagine a little boy sitting all day long knowing that he's holding his lunch in his hand that his mom prepared for him? But he's so spellbound by the stories and illustrations of Jesus. Jesus taught through parables. Mark uh, 4, verses 33 and 34 says, Jesus used stories and illustrations to teach the people. It says, in fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. Some of our dry, boring preachers today could take a lesson from Jesus. We're talking about how Jesus influenced. He, he influenced through exhortation. He taught them publicly. He, he taught them through parables, and he taught them principles. Principles. In Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 12, the Sermon on the Mount begins. And it begins with the Beatitudes or the blessings that Jesus gave. Let me, let, let me read them. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 12 says, And seeing the multitudes, Jesus went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. He what? And taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice, be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This was just the introduction to the sermon of Jesus. His, his sermon or his teaching was, was filled with principles. And these principles, if applied, will enhance our lives like nothing else will. Jesus, our greatest influencer, modeled the perfect way of influence. I ask us today, how about us? Do we take advantage of teachable moments? There are times when I'm walking with my staff, especially the younger ones, and, and something will come up, and I'll say, hey, let me just take a moment here, and just this is a good time for a teachable moment. Do we take advantage of teachable moments? Do we speak in a way that is interesting and engaging? Because it doesn't matter how profound you are if nobody is listening. 
Do we pass on principles and life-changing teachings and knowledge to those that, that we have influence over? How did Jesus influence? He influenced through example. He influenced through exhortation. And number three this morning, through explanation. Explanation. He, he, he explained privately what he had spoken publicly. Mark chapter 4 verse 10 and verse 34 says, Later when Jesus was alone with the twelve, they asked him to explain the parables. Verse 34 says, he explained everything to them. Think about this this morning. Think about this. Only those closest to him got to hear the details. It's better than your response. I, I said only those closest to him got to hear the details. Only those closest to him got to go deeper. Two things that we can learn from this. Number one, don't reveal everything to everyone. Because only those who are willing to get close to you earn the right. See, I'm not going to share the intimate details of my life. I'm not going to share everything with everybody. Oh, those details, those intimate parts, oh, those deeper things about me are only going to be shared with those that are interested enough in me to spend some time with me. So don't reveal everything to everyone. Only those that are willing to get close to you earn the right. And number two, it pays to get close to Jesus. It pays to get close to Jesus because those closest to him get the details. Those closest to him get to go deeper with him. That's really good stuff, amen. Just keep preaching, man. You're doing good, amen. The greatest influencer influenced through explanation. Not only did he explain privately what he had spoken publicly, but also, also he remained patient with their slowness to understand. John 13 and 1 says, Jesus loved his disciples, watch this, to the very end. To the very end. See, the disciples had plenty of faults. They failed over and over. They were dense at times. They did dumb stuff sometimes. They even doubted from time to time. But Jesus never gave up on them. He could have fired the whole lot of them and chosen 12 new ones. But he didn't. He loved them to the end. He knew their flaws when he chose them. He knew their weaknesses and limitations when he called them. And he knows ours. He knows ours. Let's take our cue from the, from the greatest influencer. Let's, let's influence not only through exhortation, but also through explanation, all patiently and lovingly breaking things down into bite-sized pieces that are easily digested. Often we become impatient with people because they don't grasp something quite quick enough, but we fail to remember that, that it's been a process for us, a process that might even have taken years, and we're expecting them to grasp and endorse and even celebrate something that we've just shared with them. Jesus loved them faults and all, warts and all, failings and all. And so he does. 
us as well. Amen. The takeaway for the message this morning is this. There's no greater influencer than Jesus. The question I have for you this morning and for us today is, are we taking advantage of his influence by spending time in his presence? Because we will only be influenced by the greatest influencer if we spend time in his presence, time in his word, time on our knees, time in the house of God, time in his presence. Write this down. It's not in your notes this morning. It should be a series of its own. In his presence, we will be enlightened. In his presence, we will be enlightened. And in his presence, we will be encouraged. And in his presence, we will be energized. Amen. Father, I thank you today. Father, for your living word. Father, your word is alive and active. Thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that illuminates, brings to life the word of the Lord. Oh, Jesus, I thank you that you are the greatest, the greatest influencer. My life has, has been changed and my life has become what it is because of of your influence, Lord. Thank you for that influence. And God, I, you said that you've given us an example that what you did to us and for us, we should do to and for those that you place under our sphere.